chapter. It's been a blessing to read it and to study it. And uh, we will conclude Revelation tonight. We'll be in the last chapter, beginning in the sixth verse till the very end. Tonight's uh, lesson is entitled, Jesus is Coming Soon. And uh, if you don't get anything else out of Revelation, I hope you remember that. Jesus is coming soon. Um, one, one guy said it this way. He said, in many ways, the Bible ends as it begins. Humanity is again in paradise, enjoying full fellowship with God. An amazing river provides abundance of fruit. The tree of life is present. And between the beginning and the end of the Bible... However, it's the story of human sin and God's gracious provision of undeserved salvation. And the one who has promised this, was, is the, or the one who was promised as the mysterious seed of the woman in the book of Genesis, is in the final chapter of Revelation, referred to as the Lamb, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star, and the Lord Jesus. We have gone far beyond the paradise of the Garden of Eden. We are challenged in this last chapter of the Bible to believe and build our lives around two core truths, and that is, number one, that this book of Revelation particularly is authenticated by Jesus himself and that he is coming soon. I like what uh, Thomas Schreiner said. He says, you know, if you're a Christian, Jesus' return will be the happiest day of your life. And if you're an unbeliever, it'll be the worst day of your life. And so the question has to be, are you ready for that day? I'm reminded of when I was 17 years old, uh, the Lord was drawing me and I responded to some friends that invited me to church and I began to come to church uh, and, and hear the gospel preached. And after about six months of hearing the gospel preached, uh, the pastor stood up one Sunday and preached on the Lord's coming back. And it really convicted me because for the first time I realized if he comes back, I'm not ready. And that was a prompt for me to say, you know, I need to, I need to get this thing settled and I need to get it right before I don't have an opportunity. And so I did. In the last chapter of Revelation, I kind of liked uh, Adrian Rogers' outline on this, but um, so I'll give credit where credit's due. But um, there are four things we see in this last chapter of Revelation 22, and the first one is a last prophecy. Look, if you will, in Revelation 22, verse 6, John is speaking. He says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And then he said to me, Don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness, and let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now what stands out, there's a lot here, we'll look at it, but what stands out to me is uh, this is a little bit different than what God told Daniel. If you'll remember the book of Daniel, uh, he got a glimpse of what was going to happen into the future, and he said, seal it up, it's not time yet. Now God has revealed it to John, and he is saying, um, don't seal it up. Don't seal up the words of this prophecy of this book, verse 10, because the time is near. And so certainly that gets your attention. Um, so here he's authenticating the book. These words are faithful and true. 
and um, God has shown uh, his servant what is going to take place. And you have this uh, blessing where he says, look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And that's what I love. That's a promise of blessing to all of us that are willing to keep the words of this book, particularly not just the Bible, but particularly the book of Revelation. It has its own special uh, blessing pronounced right here. And then, of course, um, John, I love, don't you love this about the Bible? It's, it's, a, it's an honest book. It, it reveals even the not so flattering parts about ourselves and others. Uh, John even includes here the fact that after he took all this in, he bowed down and worshiped the angel. Now, he, I, I believe in my heart, he knew better than that. But when you get, you know, when you, when you get all this laid on you, I think it probably got him a little stirred up and a little overwhelmed. And in the moment, he, his emotions got the best of him. And he's corrected by an angel. Hey, don't worship me. Worship God. And so, um, you know, that's in there as well, which to me authenticates the book because um, if you were trying to pass this off as some, um, some, something that somebody made up, they, they probably wouldn't put that in there. It would be, you know, a, a strike against it. But this is a proof of the authenticity of it. And then, of course, you've got this uh, peculiar statement in verse 11. Uh, look at it. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go in righteousness, and let the holy still be holy. And you might say, what in the world does that mean? Well, remember a while ago when I said about, I think of Daniel when I read this last passage here, because Daniel was told to seal up the book. It wasn't time yet. It would be later in the future. And here is John getting you know, more prophecy and God tells him, don't seal up the prophecy of this book because the time is near. And so that made me go back and look at Daniel again. And when you get to the end of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, he says a peculiar statement as well that I think links to Revelation 22, verse 11. In Daniel 12, verse 10, he says, Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but... The wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. And I think what Daniel's trying to say, what John is trying to say, is that uh, people are going to be people. Their character is going to be revealed. And when Christ comes back, no matter who they are, what they've done, uh, it's going to be made plain. I like what Albert uh, Barnes said in his commentary. He says it this way, At the close of this book, and at the close of the whole volume of revealed truth, it was proper to declare in the most solemn manner that when these events were consummated, everything would be fixed and unchanging, that all who were then found to be righteous would remain so forever, and that none who were impenitent, impure, and wicked would ever change their character or condition. That this is the meaning here seems to me to be plain, and this sentiment accords with all that is said in the Bible of the final condition of the righteous and the wicked. And I would agree. Herschel Hobbes, he says, it means that there will be no second chances for the wicked after this life. The sufferings which they endured on earth did not bring repentance, and there will be no purging effect in hell. Rather, they will... Rather, they will in their eternal suffering blaspheme God all the more. They will become progressively worse, not better, while those in heaven will grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. What a terrible prospect for the lost, and what a glorious prospect for the redeemed. Well, that's true. I mean, for those that know the Lord, we're going to become like Him as He is, so we will be. And boy, what, a, what an amazing thought that is, and yet... Those that don't know the Lord, not only will they be separated from Him, but I think they'll just be more and more hardened in their position. And, and that's consistent with Revelation. If you go back and look at some of the judgments and the plagues that happen, um, it gets worse and people still refuse to repent. And so it's sad that it gets to that point. Um, Warren Wiersbe, he said, Heaven is more than a destination, it's a motivation. 
And knowing that we shall dwell in the heavenly city ought to make a difference in our lives here and now. And I agree. And so when you read this first uh, few verses here from 6 to 13, uh, we ought to be prepared that Jesus is coming. Blessed, as he says in verse 7, is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. We now have record here that uh, Jesus is coming back. One day he will come and he will judge and he will rule and he will reign forever. And so we want to be prepared for that day and we want to look forward to his return. And the best way we can do that is to keep the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, one of the four last things in this chapter, we just looked at the last prophecy. Jesus is coming back. We need to be ready. Now let's look at the last invitation. I think it's only fitting that uh, the Bible closes with an invitation. Uh, Look, if you will, in Revelation 22, verse 14. Uh, This is the last uh, beatitude. There's there's seven beatitudes in Revelation. They all start with blessed, kind of like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are you know, the poor in spirit for theirs, the kingdom of you know, heaven and so forth. Well, there's seven beatitudes. They all start with blessed in the book of Revelation. And the last two are in this final chapter. We just mentioned one in verse 7. And now the, the last one is here in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty Come, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Now, here is the last invitation. And uh, it says, blessed are those who wash their robes. The only other time that that kind of imagery and language is used about washing robes is earlier in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 14. It says... um, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And I wanted to read that verse because I wanted to call to attention, uh, how do you wash a a, a robe? Well, it has to be washed uh, and become clean through the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus. Okay, So you and I, when we stand before God someday, we will be clothed in Christ's righteousness. We are standing there not because of ourselves. We're standing there because of what he's done for us. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus. And so we are in a washed, clean robe, which reflects the righteousness that we have in Christ because of the shed blood of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And so how have you been washed? Um, When you look at this, Um, you see the separation of the righteous and the wicked. Those that are washed, uh, those that have been covered by the blood of the Lamb, have the right, according to verse 14, to the tree of life, and they may enter the city. Okay, The tree of life, and they enter the city, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And outside are all those that love and practice falsehood and all these other, um, other sins. They don't love God. And so are we washed? The divine authority of Christ bears a witness in this book, and he calls his hearers to embrace the promises, to accept the invitations, and to be warned. And that's what he's doing here in this last chapter of Revelation. William Hendrickson says the emphasis is on the word freely. Notice he says, come. Both the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, And the bride, which would be God's people, say, Come, let anyone who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Do you see that? Take the water of life freely. It reminds me of that verse in in, uh, Isaiah where the prophet says, Come, buy, and eat, and drink 
without cost. Well, how can you buy something when it doesn't cost anything, right? That means it's freely given. And here, he's telling us to come, and he says, the emphasis is on the word freely, let them not hesitate, let them come, let them take. It costs them nothing, William Henderson says, because he paid the price, so let them come, take, and drink. Um, He has, indeed, Christ has paid the price, and that's why we are invited to share the good news, the gospel, with everyone and to invite them to come uh, and, and receive Christ before it's everlasting too late. Blessed are those who wash their robes and they have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. So we have a last prophecy. Jesus is coming soon. We have a last invitation. Come, okay, come, come to Jesus. And uh, now we have a last warning. Look, if you will, in verse 18. John writes, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, the punishment In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19 here, about adding to and taking away, uh, it's kind of ironic the way he says it. Those adding to the book will have added to them the plagues of the book, and those taking away from the words of the book will have taken away from them the eternal blessings that are written in the book. So it's a warning to make us think twice. And um, in John chapter 5, which is the gospel that John wrote, he is quoting Jesus in John 5, 35, and Jesus, uh, or John 5, 36, I guess, and um, Jesus said this, I have a greater testimony than John's, referring to John the Baptist, because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me, You've not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures, okay? He's talking to the religious people of his day. Because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Uh, I've always said that the written word which is the bible bears witness to the living word which is jesus you might say well how do you know jesus is the living word remember john's gospel chapter one in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and then down to verse 14 john 1 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us so jesus christ is the living word of god and so the written word points people to the living word which is jesus And so here we are reminded that the prophecies of this book point to the one that is authenticating them, who is Jesus. And he warns us, don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. And then he testifies about these things. Yes, I am coming soon. Okay? And so uh, will you and I believe God's word about God's Son. I believe that's what it comes down to. Will we believe the Word of God about the Son of God? And then, of course, in this last chapter, we've seen a last prophecy. Jesus is coming soon. A last invitation. He says, come. And a last warning. Don't take anything away from it. Don't add anything to it. And then the last thing is a last prayer. The Bible ends with a prayer. How fitting is that, right? The very last verse, verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. That's how you know it was a prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, So the whole book of Revelation is meant to stir our longings and our prayers 
for the realization of God's purposes, which will take place at the second coming of Christ. I mean, if you read the whole New Testament, uh, we kind of lean in because now that Christ has come and now that he has risen from the dead, we know that he is coming soon. He's coming back. And when he comes back, all of creation is groaning and yearning and waiting for the sons of God, the children of God, to be revealed. And so are you ready for the Lord's return? Let me wrap this up. Um, let me say it this way. How will you respond as we think about um, Revelation? It's, it's, we've spent so much time going through it, I'm not going to review it. But just think for a moment of all the stuff that we've read in Revelation, the things that we've studied and talked about, and it comes down to this, a final prophecy, a, um, a final invitation, a final warning, and a final prayer. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready for the Lord's return? How, how will you respond to this final message, not only of the book of Revelation, but quite frankly, the final chapter of the entire Bible. I mean, this is the end, right? This is the end. And so I'm going to give you three things to think about. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Number one, the Scripture is reliable, okay? As you think about how you should respond to this message, I want to remind you that the Scripture is reliable. He said in verse uh, 6, these words are faithful and true, okay? You can trust God's Word. He says, blessed are those of you who hear this and keep it, okay? And uh, he warns us not to add anything to it and not to take anything from it because God's word is reliable and enough said on that. Number two, the Savior will return. Over and over and over again, when we go through Revelation, regardless of your viewpoint on this, that, and the other, please realize that we serve a risen Lord who is coming back. Amen? He's coming back. And I know that, um, you know, we're not supposed to set dates. He told us that. He says no man knows the day or the hour, okay? Um, uh, only the Father knows that. But we need to be ready. We don't need to be unaware. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to be longing for His appearing. The Savior will return. So the Scripture is reliable. The Savior will return. And the last thing here is the Holy Spirit is the final witness. Uh, I love verse 17. Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take the water of life freely. And then it ends by, with him saying, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. He is coming, and the Holy Spirit is the final witness. We had God the Father, um, and then we had Jesus the Son, and now we have the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is, is that final witness to say, yes, He is coming again. And uh, I want to uh, end on this note. The way I like to explain Revelation, I mean just bottom shelf, the most basic, simplest terms I can is this last statement here. Look, if you will, and um, make sure I get it right. Verse 19, yeah. Look at verse 19. I think it sums up Revelation better than any commentary I've read. Here, here's what it says. It says, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. So what's written about in this book called Revelation? The tree of life and the holy city. In other words, if you don't understand the message about the tree of life and the holy city, then you've missed the whole point of Revelation. Okay? Yes, it's about Jesus. And yes, it's about the fact that he's coming back. But the bottom line, when you go to the beginning of the book, when he's talking to the churches, and when you get down here to the very end of the book, he kind of ties it all together. This book is about the tree of life and the holy city. And um, you and I need to realize the tree of life started in the Garden of Eden. And because Adam and Eve sinned, 
because they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were now separated from God. They were in a fallen, sinful condition. And God in His mercy said, we cannot let them eat of the tree of life or they'll live forever. And you might say, well, why is that such a bad thing? Because to live forever in a fallen, sinful condition where you're separated from God, for that to be forever, that'd be bad. That, that's basically hell, right? I mean, to be forever separated from Christ in eternity, that's hell. And so what did he do? He banished Adam and Eve from the garden. He put uh, angels with a flaming sword to protect the tree of life. And all of a sudden, the tree of life just disappears, falls off the map, falls off the radar. And then we get to Revelation, and lo and behold, there's that tree of life again. Okay, And this time, people have the right to, to come to the tree of life. But on what grounds? What qualifies them to have the right to share in this tree of life? And that's the tree of Calvary. You've heard me share this before. Christ, according to Peter, died on a tree. He died on that cross for you and me. He shed his blood. And so it's one thing for us to realize, hey, I'm a sinner. But then we have to realize, I need a Savior. And that's what Calvary's tree is all about. To realize that Christ came, that he is the Son of God, that he lived the life you and I should have lived. He died the death that you and I deserve. And he took our place. And when we come to Christ... And we receive a robe of righteousness because now we have been washed in the blood of Jesus. Now we have a right standing before God. And now we have the right to eat of the tree of life. And that's what's so good here when you read that, is that we now have the right. Look in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right... To the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates and so please understand that at the end of the day regardless of what your view of prophecy and revelation is if you miss the tree of life and if you miss the holy city you've missed the whole point of the book and that's why he says it a couple of times in this closing chapter so that as we leave this book and close it up, the last lingering thought in our minds is Jesus is coming. He's coming back. Okay, he's coming soon. Have I been washed by his blood? Have I been clothed in a robe of righteousness? Do I have the right to eat of the tree of life? Will I enter the gate of the holy city? And that's what it all comes down to. And it's my prayer tonight that um, you can affirm, you know, an answer of yes to those questions. And so my challenge for you tonight is this. Will you experience the benefits of the tree of life and the holy city? If you are saying, uh, maybe you're thinking in your heart right now, well, you know, I've never thought about it like that before. But now that you mention it, I'm not sure. Well, let me take a moment to talk to you. And let me just say, all you got to do is come to Jesus. He said here, he says, let the spirit and the bride say, come. And let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Come to Jesus. Tonight, if you hear his voice, you need to come to him. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's not my words, that's God's words. And he says, one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. You know, if you, if you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe he died on that cross and he rose again, uh, then you will be saved. And it goes on to say in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not only will you believe it in your heart, but you'll confess it with your mouth and you will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That, that's why prayer is so important. Uh, you have to ask the Lord to do this for you. Um, it's very simple. And, and when Paul was confronted by the jailer in Acts 16, 
He told the man, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Do you believe Jesus and will you receive him into your life? And then, of course, I'll close with one final verse, and that is John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that good? And so when you think about Revelation, tonight, I, I pray tonight that when you lay your head down on the pillow, that you'll take a moment to think about, wow, we've gone through the book of Revelation, and there's a lot of twists and turns. There's a lot of places you could dig and dig deep. But I hope you remember this last prophecy that Jesus is coming soon. This last invitation that if you hear, uh, if you hear his voice, come, come to Jesus before it's too late. This last warning, don't add anything to it and don't take anything away from, from it. And this last prayer, come Lord Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I must say this, after the past, what, year to year and a half that we've had, I've thought more about this than I have any other time in my life, you know. And I pray that we'll be more aware of God's work in the world. And I pray that we will pray for God's will to be done on earth, amen, as it is in heaven. And one day, well, it will be. Well, let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for this time and your word. Lord, thank you for reminding us, Lord, that this book is about the tree of life and the holy city. And Lord, the only way that we can partake of the tree of life and enter the holy city is to be washed in the blood of the lamb the lamb of god who was given for the sins of the world lord i pray that if we hear your voice tonight we will come to you before it's everlasting too late and lord for those that already have that have received you as as lord in their lives lord may we Continue to yearn for the grace and glory of God. And may we pray, come Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. Well.